Welcome everyone to the 25th anniversary of the Fantasia International Film Festival. It is my pleasure and privilege to be presenting Stephen Saadian, the one and only legend who got his start at Hustler and by the end of the 1980s made some of the most iconic underground films of the late 20th century. Today we're here to talk about his career and especially his film Dr. Caligari. Um, for those who may not be aware, uh, Dr. Car Caligari is a bizarre, stunning, goofy, and unsettling film that embraces the avant-garde. As the film's title suggests, it's kind of a loose remake of the German Expressionist classic um, and follows Mrs. Van Houten, a woman who seems to be losing touch with reality and her treatment under Dr. Caligari. Uh, the film was recently restored by Aston Acid Pictures and is going to be distributed by Mondo Macabro, a huge thanks to the incredible team behind this restoration. You're honestly doing God's work. Um, this is such an incredible restoration, so beautifully done. Um, special shout out to the restoration supervisor, uh, Wojtek Janio, uh, colorist Gosham Grissom, and the restoration producer, Daniel Bird. Um, for those who kind of want to get your hands on it, the film will be released uh, for public purchase in 2022. So. Uh, mark your calendars. Um, I'd like to welcome you, Stephen. Thank you so much for being here. Very nice to be part of the 25th anniversary of Fantasia. And we will erect an altar to the team that did the restoration. Right? Like, I mean, it's like they've done such incredible work before and they like just absolutely knock it out of the park. I feel like for people who have seen the film before, they've probably never seen it this good unless they saw it maybe in their initial release. So I think um, it's even better than when it was initially released. Uh, they did such a good job with it. And of course, uh, Pete Toombs. And, of um, course, Pete uh, Toombs. They were the ones that said, restore it and we want it. And that's the company I was hoping to go to. So it was a perfect marriage. Yeah, I love it. Um, I feel like we have so much ground to cover. It's like, you have such an incredible career and Dr. Caligari is such a singular work. Um, I was thinking we can just jump right in. We're kind of going back in time. Um, and for everyone who is watching, this is gonna be a very visual presentation. We're gonna have a lot of, it's gonna be a very show and tell. And I think that that's fun for both of us. It should be fun for you. Um, so let's get to, let's get, get a start. Um, first, uh, let's take a look at this image. Uh, we call it the curtail image. Do you wanna kind of talk to us a little bit mm -hmm about how you put it together and why it's important for your career? This is important for me because this was actually the first photograph I ever set up. I did that in 1975 in my apartment and I had never done what would be considered a professional piece of work. And of course there was no buyer for it. I just had this concept, I think I will start putting together some visuals with copy, photography, satire. And um, I used to send a lot of things out to magazines and I would send it with the idea, the concept and the copy included. And they never got what I was going for. So I said, you know, I'm gonna have to just set this whole thing up, including the typeface. I typeset it, I did the whole thing. And uh, that was the first one. Texas Chainsaw Massacre had just come out. I thought it was ripe for parody, even though it's not a parody of that, but the idea of a chainsaw and uh, went to a, uh, a hardware store and looked through the catalog, saw an ad for a company and just did a takeoff on that. And in terms of like how this film kind of helped launch your career, who ended up seeing um, this photo and how did that kind of like unfold um, in terms of like giving you your, your first big chance really. Of course, after I did this in, by the way, the model in that picture is me. I mean, it was really low budget. I had to cast myself and uh, it's about 20 years old, I think. And I uh, decided I'm gonna do more of these. I'm gonna do a series. So I put together five or six uh, with the same sort of feel and I decided where will I take it? And originally it was gonna be the National Lampoon because they had expressed some interest since in the previous stuff I saw. I had somebody there who was kind of a mentor named Michael O'Donohue. But along the way, another Lampoon staffer told me, there's a magazine called Hustler and I hadn't heard of it. It had just started, it had been up for a while. And they said, 
you may have a lot of luck there and it's kind of just a startup and that's who I presented it to. This picture and five or six others and eventually they bought it, my entire portfolio of these pictures and that's how it got going. And that's how I began my work at Hustler. And so the next image we're kind of having a look at is uh, Slave Boy, which is also, it's, I, I guess I we would call it like the beginning of the parody images. Um, right. Do you kind of want to discuss this one a little bit too? Right, that was in the original series. What I did was um, when I presented them to Larry Flint and he saw my portfolio, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do with these, but I'm just going to buy your entire portfolio. So he took all of my work, gave me a nice big check. And after I was defibrillated and revived and got out of the office in Columbus because I was overwhelmed, um, they called me up and they said, we're going to run this. So when I sold the parodies and the pictures to a Hustler, they wanted more. So I decided to do some in the same, uh, in the same vein. And I knew Playboy would be right for parody, especially in Hustler. So they had a national ad campaign, what sort of man reads Playboy. I just changed it to Slayboy because Hustler was into a little bit of the bloods, blood and guts. And my, every woman in it was all my crew. You know, we had a collective, including Belinda, my ex-wife, who was a stylist and a good friend still. And uh, there was actually a real Playboy bunny who was a friend in there. So. I sent that as part of the original package and uh, they were very pleased. And they were awful pleased that they gave me an extra assignment and I delivered the goods. So they realized, okay, maybe this guy can do this all the time. And I mean, kind of what you end up doing is like a, a little bit of everything for Hustler, right? Um, yeah. And maybe like some of the most notable things you do are these ads for product, uh, mail-in products including uh, sex toys and dildos in particular. So uh, we are kind of showing off this, like, I guess we'll call it a series, the Dueling Dealing and Dunkin' Dildos. Do you kind of want to talk about those as products? Those, yeah, those are worth talking about because they were extremely popular. What happened when I got to Hustler, they still had national advertising, but Larry Flint was at war with the national advertiser. And back then, the main advertisers were stereo companies and liquor, not liquor, cigarette companies. And the cigarette companies were coming very down on the editorial content of the magazine. The explicitness of the nudes. And they saw a lot of, I think, political stuff coming in. And they were pressuring Larry, if you want us to buy your back page and other ads in the magazine, which was a lot of revenue, you're going to have to calm down the, uh, tame down the editorial. So when Larry hired me, he said, I've got this idea, rather than depend on national advertising, let's do our own in-house advertising. And he so showed me some examples and they were all sex products and they looked very much like what you'd expect it to work. And I said, well, what, is the, what is the ultimate goal? He goes, all I want you to do is entertain. Entertain my, the people that buy the magazine. If we sell the product, that would be fantastic. If we don't sell it, but it looks fun, I like that too. So I got this remarkable job as the creative director of the advertising department. And the only person probably in the world to have that job where I had full color, five or six, seven pages sometimes a month. And I just took off with that. And I decided I was just going to have a lot of fun with it. Make it a parody, make it a uh, just really not ever take it seriously. And lo and behold, it not only went over well with audiences, it sold like crazy. We had coupons and we had fun with the coupons even. We tried to tie it into what the ad looked like. And uh, you ran, did a lot for the magazine. It was a very popular section, not even considered ads, more like editorial content. And I think it's going to be uh, important. So some of the people who are going to be watching this are very familiar with Hustler and what they do. But I think that um, there's also potentially a lot of people who don't know. Maybe they know that it is a, like a sex magazine, like Playboy or whatever. But do you kind of want to distinguish what's the difference between Hustler? Because what Larry Flint was doing is still completely unique in terms of like, not just like, 
those kind of nudie magazines, but in terms of the entire magazine industry, um, in terms of pol politics, uh, incredibly leftist, right? Right. Um, do you want to kind of talk about that uh, a little bit, just for people who may or may not be familiar with it? Well, especially then. It was a complete different magazine. I'm talking between 1975 until he was shot in 1978. That was the banner years of the magazine. That's when we were in Columbus, Ohio, which was a great place to do a magazine because Larry would get talent from all over the world, actually. And once you're in Columbus, there was nothing to do but really work on the magazine. So it was, it was pretty terrific. But he, you wouldn't know it today if you looked at a hustler, even anyone in the last 10, 15 years, I suppose. I haven't kept up with them. But when we were doing it, it was, uh, like you said, it was a part, it was a humor magazine. It was a leftist magazine. And it got, grew more and more to the left. And uh, the sex was a big part of it, obviously, and probably what turned it into a phenomenon because of the explicitness. But always tongue in cheek, really. It was a uh, it was a fun magazine and we were the biggest thing in town in Columbus. They sort of loved having us because every time we went to work, there were protests. I mean, we walked through a lot of protests. And I think they showed it when the Milos Forman film, uh, some of that, but it was even crazier than was portrayed in the motion picture. But I had a wonderful time because I was given total creative freedom. And at 22, to be told, you're gonna get 10 pages every month of a magazine to do whatever you want. As long as you stay within the parameters of what the magazine was about, you can do anything. And I was the only person that, in the history of that magazine that had that. And not too long ago, I asked Larry, why did you give me that freedom? And he said, two reasons. One, I like what you did. And two, you were the only employee that I can see how much that revenue you were bringing in. Because every time the ads came in, I said, well, this kid's responsible. So I had it going both ways, I guess. But it was a, it was a pleasure for me. It wasn't for maybe for everybody else, but I had a great time. I built my own studio in what was once a bar in Columbus. And I kind of lived there 24 hours. I had a great crew. We were all the models in the ads. So it was, it was fun. Uh, so next, we're kind of going to move. You kind of talked a little, like you kind of alluded to it a little bit. Uh, we're going to take a look at two um, cigarette ads, uh, the Welcome to Marlboro and uh, Some Things Go Together, Smoking and Suicide. Uh, do you kind of want to talk about the direction that you took with those and how they kind of work in the development of the, of the work you were doing? That goes back to when the cigarette companies pulled out. Larry, Less being a cigar anti-cigarette crusader at the time, I think he was smoking. I'm not sure, a little bit maybe, but it was okay. They want to pull their ads. Let's have some fun, and brave. He was as brave as you can be, and so he told me, just go after him. Go go, and I just started turning out. I was doing one or two a month, and the big part of it, if you look at the Marlboro ad, which is pretty remarkable. We didn't use artificial names, fake names, parody names, which you would see in Mad and the Lampoon. We used the actual company name. And I remember when I first talked to Larry about it, he said, what are they gonna do, Sue? And I said, yeah, he goes, we'll put ad parody night to be taken seriously and we'll be covered. So on the Marlboro, which was the first time we ever used the real name of the product, uh, we didn't hear a thing and uh, it was, went very effective. It was got a lot of great, great reaction. The anti-smoking ads in general, we were getting letters from all different organizations. I don't, you know, that saw them probably uh, didn't want to say too much because it was Hustler, but they were highly, highly touted. People enjoyed them. I think I did in total 15 maybe. And they're still That's very good awesome. examples. Even in, a, even in a world that's a lot more anti-smoking right now, um, you still look at them and they are, they're shocking in a way that's very, very exciting. I don't know, I, I find they resonate. They, yeah, and the funny thing is they don't date because people don't, I mean, somebody today wouldn't know about the Marlboro Man. You'd have to yes. be over 40, I suppose, to, unless you heard of it. But that Marlboro country, that was a major theme for Marlboro cigarettes. 
And um, the one about smoking and suicide, I actually did that before I was on staff. That's another thing. They tested me a few times. They said, what can you come up with with smoking? So I did that one. And they loved it. It ran on the back cover of the magazine beginning in 76. And uh, I enjoyed that series. I always often thought I should put that out. And you have to remember, parody and satire, which is all over the internet, everybody does it with a computer. Back then, you know, you didn't see it. You saw it in the National Lampoon. You saw it occasionally. Yeah, I said in Mad, maybe a tame, but you saw it in Mad. But that was it. You kind of you weren't seeing that kind of stuff, especially in a glossy four color way, which was the same with the sex toy ads. You just, if you saw those kind of ads at all, they were in the back pages of a, you know, a, an adult bookstore. But, and you want to know something very funny. I was, uh, those ads, we used to get letters from all different kinds of people not interested in sex products, but saying how much they enjoyed them. So, oh, that's so cute. Yeah, was, <laughs> I love that. I sent one to um, a book of kitsch, which was very popular. I thought, you know, uh, I sent a love doll ad. And the author of the book of kitsch, which was a wonderful coffee table book, he said, no, Stephen, it doesn't belong because it's just too witty. It's mm -hmm. too intentional, so you don't make it because I wanted to be in the book of kitsch. He said, no. He goes, too, too sophisticated to be yeah, kitsch. <laughs> really, yeah, I saved that letter, but uh, I wanted to so a kitsch book. Um, so what we're going to move on to next, like one of the things you did is you did a lot of a cover art. So we could have chosen um, a lot of them, but we're specifically going for a scarecrow, which for people who've seen Caligari might be a somewhat familiar image. Um, this is kind of a period where you're developing your style, you're having a lot of opportunity to kind of experiment, to, to play, um, and to kind of develop as an artist. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about this cover and working as a cover artist too? Yeah, the funny thing is from the time I started going back to that chainsaw ad, I always thought the most important thing is to have a singular style. And I was not interested in being a director of photography. I wanted to work with photographers, all different photographers. But the singular style comes from me, the art director, the creator, the writer, the creative director, so to speak. And I didn't know if you can do that. Uh, I knew directors did it with directors of photography and cinema, but can that be done with stills? I was, just didn't know if that was a reality. Plus, how do you develop a style? It took me many years to try to figure out what is my style. The reason why this is relevant to what we're discussing today is because Caligari was the end result of what I was trying to do from when I started. I made Caligari in 89, but if I, from 75, I said, where will this go? And kept taking pictures. And it took many years before I found a style. I was all over the place. The scarecrow conceptually, I realized just a simple flat color with a strong image in front could be the first step in doing what I want to do. And Larry likes themes, which was fun. And you didn't have to get the cover approved. We just went into the studio. And at that time, the director of photography of the magazine was a guy by the name of Francis D'Elia, Frank. And Frank and I met and we teamed up immediately. We were simpatico. And uh, I was doing the creative ideas, but Frank was teaching me about the light and what you can do and that still photography does not have to look like what magazine, it could look cinematic. So that's how that started where I would say that was a seminal image because Frank and I did it together and we started playing around with the light. We couldn't do it there because Hustler had a distinct style that you had to stay photographically. They used 35 millimeter Kodachrome, but we talked about it. So that image was in the back of my mind always when I made the scarecrow image in Caligari 15 years later. And so, I mean, you just mentioned Frank. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the other future collaborators or ongoing collaborators you actually met during this period working at Hustler? Because uh, one of the incredible things about you as a person and you as an artist is that you have some very consistent collaborators, um, which I think speaks to your vision, but also just your 
very warm personality. People want to work with you, right? Yeah, it's unbelievable. I don't think I go back to my very first collaborators. Um, I'm still always trying to get them on board. Frank and was very important um, because he he really uh, talked to me about the anti, what he called the refrigerator light, let the set looks like it's lit by a jumbo and refrigerator. And that you can use tungsten light on the sets. That came from him. And you don't have to use umbrellas and strobe lights. You can use cinematic lights. And if you do it long enough with stills, when you get your first motion picture assignment, you just don't change anything except people are moving. So it was a great stepping stone and I always, give Frank the credit for that because I don't know if I would have, if I hadn't met him, I may have found that, but I would have had a search a lot longer. The second person, and of course the most important person to me is Jerry Stahl, the writer who came to the magazine and was you know, just one of a kind, totally unique and uh, brilliant. And even then underused, never used enough, practically unknown in the magazine, just, but I knew. I knew what was there. And we uh, were simpatico on site. And it's now 2021 and we just finished the new script. We're still working together. And uh, that's, the, that's the key. Without Jerry, um, none of the films, whether it was Night Dreams, Cafe Flesh, Caligari, they wouldn't exist at all without his input. Um, so, combination of the two of us. And then the third, a very important, came later in, uh, at Hustler, and that's Lottie Vanyansky, who, uh, when Frank and I went in different directions, Lottie, who was on staff at Hustler, became my working partner, and he was the director of photography on Dr. Caligari. Very interesting guy. As a young man, he was the James Dean of Czechoslovakia. He did a incredibly legendary film of the Czech New Wave called Diamonds of the Night and was with Milos Forman and Ivan Passer and Jan Nemec and all the great uh, New Wave Czech uh, directors. And in fact, when Milos did the movie for Hustler, Lottie was a big connection for that to happen. That's awesome. I mean, um... I, I feel like it's like we've had conversations before we've spoken now. And one question I never asked you, which feels like such an obvious one is at what point did you know or want to start making movies? Because like f you are like so passionate about cinema and like classic Hollywood, but like, you know, a little bit about everything. Was it always part of your plans to eventually make films or is it something that kind of end up kind of creeping up on you? I always thought about that, but I was as passionate about magazines as I was about films. And I thought mag it all has to start with magazines. Magazines, you know, it's, that's one of the shames of the internet because it was a, a major accomplishment to get published in a national magazine. I know I worked on it for years. I, got, I have a hundred rejection letters to prove it. And I, I, I really uh, spent a lot of time, I, I, I marvel, mad, and marvel as a writer, mad, contributed, parodies. And I mean, the rejections just came. And of course, all the work I was sending at the time wasn't worthy of being published. I didn't know it at the time. I knew mm -hmm. it. But I just kept at it. Uh, another magazine I contributed to was called We, which was the hip Playboy owned by uh, Hugh Hefner. But uh, I think film inevitably came along once I saw what we were doing. And, uh, but while I was at Hustler, I never thought of making an X-rated movie. It was the last thing on my mind. I don't even think I looked at an X-rated movie. We had a review section in Hustler where we had someone on staff who looked at the movies and reviewed them. I don't recall ever looking at that section or watching the movie. So that wasn't an interest, but Frank and I later, which we can get to when we had our own studio, that was, uh, that set it in motion. So we're going to take like a small detour, which is cinema related, but um, part of uh, kind of your development in the industry is also kind of this work with posters and box art. Um, so what we're going to start with is an image from Escape from New York of 
Kurt Russell, do you want to kind of talk about the, your images didn't end up being in the final work, but were somewhat pivotal nonetheless. Yeah, this is a nice story. Frank and I had done, Frank and I started doing one sheets, mainly horror, and we started getting quite a bit of work. And I think Frank, his, his lighting and how he lit was conducive to certain directors. You would be surprised back then. That was the, what I would call the last of the glory years of the one sheet. One sheets were a great business to be involved with. Uh, we, we did uh, quite a few Escape from New York. I think we got that job because we had done The Fog and we worked with Deborah Hill and John Carpenter with the producer and the director. And that one turned out quite nice. And then we got a job for a film called Escape from New York. Now that film hadn't even been made yet. The script was done. They sent over a sketch a thumbnail, really, not a detail sketch. And whoever rendered it had Clint Eastwood as Snake Plissken, the main character. So I don't know if John was hoping to get him or if it was just something the artist did. But I remember that drawing. And what they wanted us to do was they were going to send Kurt Russell, who was cast by now, to our studio. And could we do just some photography? And um, Kurt Russell had just made Elvis, a made for TV movie with John Carpenter. I think probably the last narrative film like that John Carpenter did. But it was a big breakthrough for Kurt Russell because everybody had just thought he was the boy from the Disney movies. And he just knocked it out of the park, did a wonderful job. So we thought about that, we brainstormed and uh, my ex-wife Belinda, who was a excellent uh, costume designer, she was thinking, well, let's create something. She designed these shirts with a zipper and two or three different kinds. They looked really good. And I think they said they wanted a snake on a tattoo. I believe so. Or maybe it was on the sketch. I think so. So we had somebody at the studio who was on our staff, Paul Peterson, our all around prop man, set builder, most valuable player kind of guy. He drew the snake on Kurt's arm when he came in and we dressed him. The eye patch, the eye patch once again, could it have been in the skip or sketch? Maybe, I don't remember, but it was there. And when Kurt saw what we did with the wall and the smoke and the barbed wire, he was very ecstatic, very, you know, he's a low key guy, but you can tell he was very happy about it. And we had a fake machine gun and, um, Probably by the time we were shooting and it was lit and Frank was clicking pictures and I was running around the set, John Carpenter came in, couldn't have been a nicer guy, smiled, saw what he did, sat, and I don't think he made a single change. I remember he saying that's the character and it was, uh, it was lovely. And eventually they went with a drawing of the one sheet. We didn't get the final one sheet, but that shot was never intended to be the one sheet. Mm -hmm. More... I think to sell the character, but it was a nice experience. And it's so funny when we used to show our work, it's not, it's a nice shot. It's not the best shot we ever did, but because the, the movie became sort of iconic, you know, we got jobs. We would show another photo that was probably 10 times better, but because it didn't have a famous person in it, that used to happen all the time. We'd show a mundane photo that we did with some, actor or actress and that got us the work you know why that is because no. that shows that because we didn't have agents i was sort of the agent they said well this young guy uh somebody paid to have him photograph this famous person so we can trust him but i always found that that's the one thing in that business while i was shopping the work i always found odd that uh it wasn't the work itself it was who was in the picture yeah, it's uh, it's very cynical. <laughs> it, is. it is, but we only got horror movies, anyways. I don't think we. Uh, I think one or two comedies, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you we could talk about a lot of them, but uh, like there, you did Funhouse, Toby Hooper, like. I like that because that was when I never saw the movie. Just saw really. The and a lot of times we didn't see the movie. We just oh, yeah, we didn't see Dressed to Kill, but it was fun because we had we 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 sort of there was a one guy who was an English producer. 
and he was a wonderful man. And he just let, just let your imagination run. And once again, the man I told you about who I called our MVP, Paul Peterson, he was the clown because uh, he was the all, we had a small team. Uh, we did 10, we all did 10 jobs, you know, so he jumped in and was the clown and Frank shot it. And it, I was very happy with that one. I wasn't crazy about the movie, but who cares? <laughs> That's fair. Um, I mean, um, I think what we're going to talk about now is Night Dreams. Um, yeah, it's a perfect transition. Is a, directed by Frank, but uh, you guys worked like so close together. Um, what I find super exciting about the film and all of your work is this kind of blurring the lines between art and cinema and pornography, uh, which is still like such a contentious thing. Uh, would you kind of like to talk about that project, how it got off the ground and uh, how it's, it's become like a bit of a, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's, there's, an, there's like cult classic. And I would say this is like an underground, it's like a secret, like there's like a, a secret handshake about the people who know Night Dreams. Exactly. I've met them. I've met a few. Yeah. And they love it. The funny thing about that film, the most important thing to me was I was only concerned of one thing, don't spend the money wisely. I was given $60,000 and they were giving it to me because the people who raised the money were, was a former uh, CEO of Hustler. And he used to say, well, just do what you did in Hustler. That's all I want you to, you know, come up with that. But I had to really protect that money. And we were paid in change but I'll tell that another time. We were paid in dollars, we were paid in change. We'll leave that where, we'll leave, let that lie. Anyways, I was concerned with that. So my job as a producer was very important because I, I, we had to finish the film, it was our first one. And we recycled and uh, a lot of the sets that were in the, uh, our studio. By then Frank and I had left Hustler we started a studio in 6646 Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, that's where we started doing all our work. We took Hustler as a client and that's what got us off and running. But the jobs of who directed, who did this, we just, you know, Frank, yeah, you, you be the director. I'm gonna be the uh, creative director. And Jerry and I wrote the script. And the funny thing about the script for Night Dreams is Jerry and I just wrote it in one day. We went off in a room and I said, I'm going to start coming up with the concepts in order. You fill in the dialogue. And we did that. And I just, and, I, and actually worked. Everything was just, it was like a stream of consciousness. Whatever you come up with and don't stop, don't change it. You've got to go with it. So we went and did that. And I recycled the Jack in the Box from the Funhouse poster. I recycled the scene. There's a scene that's a spoof on Dress to Kill, not the movie, but the one sheet. We recycled that. So that's why it looked good for $60,000. And that introduced me, more importantly, to cinema in terms of the visual end, the sound end. I concentrated more. Frank kind of looked it over the cutting. I had less to do with the cutting and all to do with the soundtrack. I was going to really have fun with it. No rules, again. I never understood why people who made adult films didn't use it as a great palette. If you have the sex, what else is there? Go in and have some fun. But you never heard good sound, never saw, saw there was never a decent soundtrack, no sound design. And I was gonna change that. And I worked really hard on the sound design. And it was noticed, it was noticed. I mean, even today, it's like such a, like we talk, it is like a film that's well known. Like you talk about Dress to Kill, like you mentioned this to me and I went to find it where Brian De Palma names it as like one of his like underrated films. He didn't remember what it was called though. He goes, this weird movie made by these guys. And he's like, there, and he like, so he, he included it, Stoya, yeah, who was, was there. Excuse me, the team word is made by these guys. That's yeah. perfect. That describes what, in, that describes what we were, these guys. <laughs> I was never into, you. we weren't into titles. You know, someone said, well, did Frank direct that? Did you direct that? We didn't, we just did. All I wanted to know is we brought it in on budget and got it done. It's funny because 
I used to wonder why don't other uh, filmmakers do that? And I was sort of cynical and sort of dismissive. And there were some good filmmakers that were doing things. Alex Dorenzi, Gary Graver, these guys have been around doing work for a long time. And uh, it took me years to look back and say, they just didn't have, they were able to make porn films and do it well, I suppose, but they didn't, they weren't able to step into new turf because they didn't have the freedom to do that. And the only reason I had the freedom and the luxury, I took it for granted, was because of my background in Hustler. And I was endorsed by Larry Flint and people knew that uh, I had worked for this big magazine, which was successful. So I was given more freedom. And that was the reputation that uh, allowed, Night Dreams we were given a budget for, it was frankly because of my work at Hustler. And that's why I was handed $60,000 to do a 35 millimeter movie. And I mean, um, with all of your films too, it's like when we talk about like why people are making adult films in general um, and in particular your work with even Hustler is the return was really good. Like that's not the most important thing but I think it is very important in terms of having a career. Uh, do you wanna talk a little bit about that aspect of I that, Yes, I do, because I'm really proud of that. People think that my movies in the adult industry, because they were so offbeat, were not big financial hits. They were these cult movies. But the fact is, they made a lot of money. I never, every one I did, and I did some things in the 90s on videotape, um, and really was having fun with it. They were hugely successful. I've never done anything that did not bring back not only the money back for my investors, it paid very well. And they told me that all the time. And that's why I kept turning down jobs. I never had any problem getting jobs. I just didn't want to keep doing adult films because there was, unless they would let me really step out and start playing around with the medium. And I don't think they were ready at that time to go that far. But had they, I think Jerry and I would have continued because um, he was adverse to me keep doing it only in that he didn't want to see us held back mm -hmm. that one genre and obviously he's went on to have a wonderful solo career which he deserves but um that's I would have kept making them but there was a line I even I couldn't cross is what I'm trying to say yeah and I don't mean listenness it's the, that was the least in, interested part of the whole thing talking about everything around it um, so we're not going to spend too much time talking about this, but I think it's super fun and interesting for people. Um, so I'm going to show an image right now of uh, from Thingfish, uh, because you worked with Frank Zappa, which is another legend. The people you worked with is just incredible. Do you kind of want to talk about Thingfish, which of course never end up being made, but maybe about your working relationship a little bit there? Yeah, that, I, I loved working with Frank. And the beauty of working with Frank is he liked my work a lot and he had responded well to it. And I had never told him I grew up as a young guy as the biggest Zappa fan in the world. I mean, especially from Freak Out in 67 up through maybe apostasy in 72. I happen to be probably one of the few people who think Frank is one of those musician artists one of a kind, obviously, who did his best work early in his career between maybe the ages of 24 and 30. Not that I like his whole catalog, but that was those six or seven, eight records were just, and I knew every scratch on my vinyl records. So when Frank wanted me to work with him, I never told him I was a fan. It was years later where I finally confessed. And I said, I think one of the reasons you might like what I do is because, heck, you don't know it, but I stole so much of your sensibility. So you probably are just responding to a smidgen of what you see. It has nothing to do with me because I just, you know, sort of stole the sensibility, if not anything else. And I wasn't a musician. So it's not like I had none of that intimidation that musicians have to do working with Frank. In fact, in terms of in the studio, uh, photographically or video, I was more experienced actually. So that was, because when you do get, you don't collaborate with Frank, you work for Frank. It doesn't matter what it's called, it's his project. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I was surprised though when we did Think Fish. That was I was a little bit frustrated because Frank and I had different ways of working. Frank, when it came to his music, he works exactly the way I would imagine I would want to work if I was a musician. It was very tight, everything under control. But in the studio, he was very loose. Uh, lots of different ideas at the time, and that was not the way I operated. But never anything but fun. And you know, for years, it was it was it was great working with Frank. Uh, he was. Uh, as funny a guy and as nice a guy as I've ever uh, collaborated with. So the next, we're going to kind of move it, like I, I've mentally divided this into like different parts. And the next section of photos, I would say is like when you're really coming into your own and you've been working for a long time in the industry and kind of searching for your style. And these different uh, photos and these different series kind of, to me, contribute to kind of like they, they lead up to, like, the, they lead to the road to Caligari. Um, so we're gonna- I'm The road gonna... I was always on. I never, and when, no matter what I was doing now, what if I went, did a job, there's, I did jobs for hire a, mm -hmm. a lot in the eighties uh, where I was behind the scenes with somebody much more well-known doing a project for them. That's, then I would back off a little bit and wasn't concerned with my style because I was in the service of someone else. But every time I did something, it was all to keep trying to find this graphic, polished style with surrealism, the mix though. I wanted the technically proficient and I was just trying to find it, but I hadn't gotten one single picture yet that said, okay, this is at least what I'm going for. Not even the posters, they were nice, but they weren't what I was trying to chase. So I'm gonna pull up an image called what we're calling Death Warmed Over, um, which you kind of told me was what you felt was maybe the first time that you really nailed yes. uh, your personal style. Do you wanna explain like what that was like and what about it kind of says I that actually to you? had a re eureka moment and what this was, Frank, was still working at Hustler. When we got to Los Angeles in January 78, I, Larry took four of us from Hustler and wanted to develop a national humor magazine to compete with the National Lampoon, taking the humor that was in Hustler. But I, have an, uh, I was trying to take it in a different direction. I was very influenced, probably the most important content-wise, to, to, to what I wanted to do was a French magazine called Harry Curie. It's the national, was the national magazine of France. And it was a humor magazine, political left. I didn't read French, so I couldn't read the, the, uh, the content, but it had great political articles apparently. But the visuals were outrageous. They had for the first time what I had saw were visual sight gags. And what I mean by that was not parody, not satire original, the way a cartoonist would draw a panel with a cartoon, the great cartoonist, Gayne Wilson or Charles Adams. And they would do photographic versions of that and then put a punchline uh, written. And I said, wow, what was that? And I had seen that. Harry Carey eventually became Charlie Hebdo. Um, De Gaulle government, after De Gaulle died, they did a parody of his life and they were shut down. And then they opened again as Charlie Hebdo. Anyways, that magazine I wanted to do in America and work with them as a American version of Hari Kiri. So we started a magazine called Slam, S-L-A-M. And we were developing that. And so Frank would come over from Hustler and would shoot some of my concepts that I would design. And this particular shot which was part of a series of, I was illustrating cliches. I would take different everyday expressions and do a visual. And this one, which was death warmed over, put together for the first time the style I thought I could move in the direction and which eventually was in Dr. Caligari. And so we're next, we're gonna move to the chickens. Um, there's a lot of them. I, I've chosen my personal favorites, which are the bondage. Uh, we have Colonel Sanders and the sunbathing. Um, and what I like about all three of these is 
they kind of touch on so many different jokes and so many different tones like they're all kind of doing something very different but are still unmistakably part of a series uh do you want to want to talk about the chickens this was a pet project no pun intended that was myself and once again paul the prop maker and our all-around set carpenter we, I came up with this idea. I went to Chinatown for some other, one reason or another, and I went into a market and they had live chickens. And I really had never seen up close chickens. And I said to myself, they all look different. They would, look, they, they would be great photographed, but I didn't like the feathers. And I thought, how are you gonna photograph their movement? But if you skinned them, you can get characters because they really looked quite amazing. So I bought one because they did it there. They pulled the feathers and I took the, and the first one we did was the, uh, oh, you know, I don't have the one we did. Uh, I don't think you have that. We did one, we set up it, we used wires and animated. It was fun. And I said, I'm gonna do a whole series. So I wrote eight or nine concepts. And then Paul and I went off on our own and did it. Frank would come in and uh, click the shutter and shoot it. And we had great luck and they en ended up going into a great French magazine called Zoom, which was sort of like for people like myself was the equivalent of being published in the New Yorker. Wow. It was a real goal to get your portfolio in Zoom. And uh, I mean, it was very happy. It was one of my goals early on. I wonder if I could ever be in Zoom. And uh, they, they bought the series and I, I enjoyed doing it. I wanted to keep doing it. They turned into postcards in Europe Oh. and uh, got a few royalty checks. <laughs> um, so the next series we're going to look at, which um, I would say is maybe my personal favorite, are the Red, White, and Blue, um, which are so, I, they feel so contemporary, but in such a way that, like, again, kind of like the cigarette ads, it's like, they're still provocative, and they're still so beautiful and singular. Uh, do you kind of want to talk about that series and yeah, that's what you're a, doing? Yeah, um, Larry had, Flint had uh, been so sick for so long and he came back to the magazine after six years and he called me and he said, have you seen Hustler lately? I said, I haven't picked one up since you left really. And he said, it's awful. He said, can you come back to work for me? And I said, I can't, I have a studio full time. I'm very busy. He goes, well, let's work something out. So he said, how about if I put you under contract and I'll give you freedom and you come up with anything you want. And I was fortunate and fortuitous to meet Lottie Von Jansky, who was the staff, one of the staff photographers. And at that time, he was the low man on the totem pole. So Larry said, you can work with any of the photographers you want. Well, I knew all of them and I knew none of them were, they're all fine and they're all good at what they do, but they weren't gonna be right for what I did. So I'm gonna take the guy who I don't know. And we met and he was, I liked him instantly. And he showed me his work, but. I didn't see in his work how we we're gonna to work together, but we talked and I heard what he was saying. He hated strobe light and he used tungsten and he was a former actor and he had a, and I went, oh, something's not right here. And he said, <laughs> don't judge me on my work. I'm under the guise of, I have to follow the formula. I didn't have, I, he knew about me. He said, I didn't have your freedom. And I said, okay, well, well. and uh, so we started working together. We did a which led to this, we did a number of things. And finally I said, let's start doing some um, with pictorials in a new way. And we started finding some, we really found our stride and I found my style with this particular photo set. And this is what I said, when it was done, I said, I wonder if I could shoot a whole movie with this feel, including like the trademarks. I had done the trademarks when I, created that free cream of weed and night dreams mm -hmm. with the box that came along, which was the most popular section in night dreams, which was the living cream of weed and the piece of bread coming to life. This was, uh, once again, I'm always recycling. It's part of my being such a, having always worked low budget. You recycle, get a good idea, use it, dine out on it, I used to say. So I took the Morton Salt Girl and the Antrimima Box and the Lipton Team and, and so let's bring them to life, but very uncluttered, a lot of distance. That's a big part of it technically. I said, 
put the photograph in front, but I want all this distance in the back, and which lets it pop. And Lottie was right on board. So got to give him some of the credit too, because he was right on. He was, he was photographing it. It was a very cinematic stuff. Not, a, not an umbrella to be seen on the set. I love that. I mean, I, I feel it's like these images for people who, for example, may not have seen Caligari, I think are the most representative of yeah. what you would kind of expect walking into that. And obviously like it's a, it's a marriage of both of your sensibilities. Um, it and it's just- years and, and, it, and it was five years, four or five years before Caligari. Wow. But, but once I did this style, I never went back. I'm not, I never, versatility is not my bag and it, and it never was meant to be. I wanted one singular style that you can just keep developing. And this was, there's no turning back. Once I saw this, everything I did sort of had that look. So next we're, I'm pulling up an image uh, we're calling Pavlov. Do you want to talk a little bit about this one too? That was part of the same series, just yeah. the same formula which was the first time started mixing uh, my own paints to, and uh, to get those rich colors, the, the day glow. Can't find at that time, I don't know about now because I haven't worked in day glow in a while, but you had trouble finding all the good. Day glow was a company that made day glow paint. You can always find the exact colors you wanted. So we would start playing around with mixing them. And that's what this series was, was one more and I'll tell you though, every, the models, they just were so into being part of these things, which I liked. And uh, everybody was really on board with it. It was Lottie and myself, and uh, we enjoyed it, the two of us. We wanted to keep doing it. We were, we were very happy. And we did more, we even did some in black and white, which is nice. a different style, which is different in terms of the way it pops, but the approach was exactly the same. You can tell it was the same person that did that um and so kind of we're moving like very close to Caligari right now so like we're kind of going on the uh what I feel is like maybe the most important not the most important but it's a very integral kind of transitional work is uh, your music video um I'm gonna show you can go find the video on YouTube for anyone who's curious um and this is the the box art for Wall of Voodoo Wall of Voodoo um, do you kind of want to talk about making this and also kind of your very brief relationship making um, music videos, which was like really at the beginning of the art form um, at this period? Well, when that yeah, was 1981, Frank got really into doing music videos. He took to the medium very well. I never wanted to do music videos. And it seems funny now, the reason I didn't want to do it. I was just really learning how to make films. And I thought if I did music videos, I was gonna develop a lot of bad habits. I was just learning about match cutting, for example. Mm -hmm. I was still just starting out, 1981. I had, I had just made Cafe Flesh. And um, I said, if I make all these music, there was no match cutting ever in music videos. And I thought it would, get me bad habits. If I wanted to be a filmmaker, I'd be better off spending my time in the theater. Subsequently, I think it was silly, you know, to think that way. But at the time I didn't, I took it very seriously. But Wall of Buddha were friends. Frank had done a previous video based on a set we did on an album cover, uh, Mexican radio. We had done the uh, album cover for that. And, but they wanted me to do a video. They were all friends. I took one of their tracks for Night Dreams. They never got paid. And uh, they did it as a favor. They didn't know it was a favor at the time. They learned once it was in the movie. Very nice about it. And it was a good, it was, it was, it was good for them ultimately. I think people associated Ring of Fire with that movie. But so I did that. And the reason I did that video more than any other reason was it gave me a chance to work with Brian Wilson, who I wanted to work with. And because uh, they did a cover tune of an old Beach Boys song. And I went and did the exact same style that Lottie and I had developed with what we call Pavlovs and Red, White and Blue. A solo dreamscape and then take individual small set pieces and bring them right on top of the dreamscape. That's really how we did a lot of distance. So, and it worked out very well. 
And uh, it was the first time I ever had to talk to somebody's, instead of the agent or representative, I got to talk to the psychiatrist, to, to Brian's psychiatrist to get Brian to do the video. I had to present the concept to the shrink. That's crazy. Yeah, well, that's how it worked. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you, you kind of talked about the fact that you decided not to do videos at that time. Um, and what ended up, from what I understand, happening instead is you end up having this this career uh, working in the theater, uh, which I also feel very much informs your later work as well. Uh, do you kind of want to talk a little bit about your theatrical work? Oh, I'll talk about just one play that was some which was really important that Jerry and I did together. And that was, uh, a, we, did a, we did 99 seat equity waiver, which means you can work with SAG actors, which I never had that opportunity. When I had a audition actors, sometimes somebody will see something and they'll say, oh, the acting wasn't so good. Well, what they don't realize is your limitation of who you can act with when you're making non-SAG pictures. You don't have a choice. But working in the theater, with equity waiver, it gave you the opportunity to have auditions. And so that I really wanted to have that opportunity. So we wrote an original play, which we thought would just run for a few weeks. And it was right in our style, the same exact thing with Lottie did the uh, lit, the, lit the theater piece, uh, Mitchell Froome, the musician who I worked with, he composed the score, Jerry and I did it. And, it was some of Jerry's really best uh, soliloquies, which is his specialty, the dialogue, uh, just wonderful. And we thought we'd play for two weeks and ended up playing about six months. Was And uh, half the Caligari cast was in this play. That's why it was important, including uh, Fox Harris and Jennifer Bell Govan and John Durbin. And uh, the actual look I learned in theater, you can have a cinematic look. It sounds sort of silly, but you really can. And you can have underscoring, you know, to, uh, to an emotion picture. So it was a, uh, a good learning experience for me to uh, that particular play. And so we're kind of reaching the climax and we're going to hopefully have the most time to talk about this. It's Dr. Caligari. Um, we haven't even spoken about this very much because we're kind of like, I want to, we both want to kind of go in this fresh. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about like how Caligari came to be? Yeah, that's worth talking about because I had made Cafe Flesh in 82 and Jerry and I had written two or three scripts during that time one called Hormone Alley, which was really interesting. And we were very close to get the financing for that. And that, that was, uh, but it didn't fall through. We kept getting, we got paid to write scripts, non-adult. I had said after Cafe Flesh, I wasn't gonna do any hardcore unless I was given all, that it did not have to try to appeal specifically to a pornographic audience. And if that had come through, I would have done, but that I didn't have that opportunity. And then I got a call from a filmmaker, from a uh, man who owned a film company specializing in mail order video, it was very big and he had made a lot of money and he apparently wanted to make movies. And he had seen a dream sequence I had done in a film called Night, what was it called? I don't think it was released, it was called Nursery Crimes. The director asked me if I would do a dream sequence. I wasn't, as, a, as a, like a special piece, I did it. Yeah. And it came out pretty nice. It was even in my reel for a little while. But, um, and he had seen this, he didn't see any of my other work. And he liked that. And he called me and he said, um, he didn't even know I was the guy. I don't think that did Cafe Flesh. But he had called me and said, I've got some money I'd like to, would you be interested? And I said, what do you have in mind? He said, well, I, I said, well, why don't you go look at my films and tell me what you think. So he saw the films and he said, I have an idea. How about if you do Night Dreams as an R-rated movie, sort of do it over. I wasn't too excited about that, but we started writing the script. Then about two weeks into it, he called me again. He said, are you familiar with the movie, Dr. Caligari? Go, you look cool I am. And he said, do you know that's public domain? You can do anything with it. I said, right, what, is, what, what does that have to do with us? And he said, because I want to use that title. 
And I said, I think that's a very bad idea. And he said, why? I said, because it's a legendary film. He said, the minute you make another one, I said, you, you, you're, out, you're out of the running. You, you never live up to the first. They tried it. I said, 20th Century Fox in 1962 made a, a film called Dr. Caligari with uh, Dan O'Hurley, uh, the Irish actor, Dan O'Hurley, yes. And um, it got terrible reviews. I actually liked it kind of. I thought it had some interesting things. And I told him this, I said, it's, it's a bad idea, but he was insistent. If you want the money, you gotta use the name. I said, okay. And he said, how is your doc, how's your night dream script? I said, well, it's fine. I said, I'll just start, because the script is, was the Caligari script. Mm -hmm. We same character, Mrs. Van Houten, which was the main character in Night Dreams. So we just went on from there and the budget originally was $100,000, which even then, 1988 was a small budget. But uh, I said, okay, I'll do it back in the soundstage. And of course, by this time, I had decided I'll never make a film on location. I'm just going to be working the studio if the budget is low, because I can, I'm the art director. I control every element. I can do my style. It was a practical decision. And that's how it all came together. I argued against that title. And then I said, i you want to call it Kelly? What do you want to call it? The cabinet? Of, I said, you can't do that. He goes, well, how about Dr. Caligari? And Jerry and I didn't like that. And I think Jerry came up with it. How about Caligari a go-go? And we'll give it the psychedelic feel. And I said, that's the ticket. And I pitched that. And he said, no, I didn't like that. So we just kept the Dr. Caligari generic, which, you know, never did much for me. But uh, that got us off and running. And that's how that happened. I mean, it's such an interesting film. It feels like it's like it's almost like he pulled the name out of nowhere. But at the end of the day, aesthetically, there are so many like obvious parallels. But the way that you make films was so similar to way, the way that they made Dr. Caligari, which in itself is such a bizarre film. And like I, we study in film school, right? No one else was making these elaborate, crazy sets to reflect like the state of mind of the characters. And that's one of the reasons we talk about it today. And the director and it, had nothing to do with it. That was all the art directors, the two, the, the team. That was, the, that was their vision. I mean, that's why Robert Wine, who directed it, you don't really ever, if you see anything else he ever did, it was the direction is nothing. But the, it was the art director and the vision of the two guys that, that, that came up with it. And in a way, if you go back and read how they worked, it was very similar, you know, similar how I do it. So, or I should say I was similar to the way they did it. It was, you know, uh, and I thought the spirit of it was what we we're gonna do. Forget trying to remake it. I mean, it's, it's not even, it's ridiculous to even kind of discuss, but the spirit isn't ridiculous. Yeah. We try to get to, uh, and, the, and I also tried to capture some of the acting with the over dramatic, and um, I tried a lot of different techniques there. And, but I had done quite a few of them in still photography. I didn't go in, I was leading up to this. By the time I made that, that was the only way I would have made the film. Yeah, and um, I mean, the kind of, you have this background in photography too. Do you wanna to talk about like um, the ways in which you kind of had unique challenges in the way that you light and frame things in terms of also just budgetary time and everything like that and how you kind of transcend them in a way that just makes it in from my perspective, like really just elevates this the film aesthetically in a way that people might not notice immediately, but like kind of when you pointed out certain things to me, I'm like, I can't unsee it. Right. Well, one of the things with that film is we knew I originally I got lucky because we shot the first two days after the dailies came back, they immediately gave me another sixty five thousand dollars. Brought me up to one hundred and sixty five thousand. And I said, okay, that, that, that bought me time. Mm -hmm. Didn't change anything, it just bought me time. And um, time was so I could spend a little bit more time on uh, the setups. And the beauty that's, the read that film would not have existed if I didn't shoot it during the writer's strike. The writer, no one was working. The writer's strike, I think was in its fifth or sixth week. I had a, the people that were coming for jobs on the tech crew, um, the camera operators, the grips. I had a, I had a incredible team put together because it was a writer's strike. Had it not been the writer's strike, 
I would have never had the opportunity. So I lucked out there. But Lottie and I just approached that film just like we had been doing. We had been working a lot and uh, we approached it just the same way. And I rehearsed it, my, that I had spent time in theater. I rehearsed for five weeks. I mean, wow. imagine rehearsing a feature film for five weeks because I moved into uh, Ray Manzarek, uh, who uh, was the keyboardist in The Doors, had a big sound stage on the corner of um, La Brea and Melrose in Hollywood. And I knew Ray and he said, just move in, you know, and we gave him, you know, paid him. But I moved in, I did all the pre-production there, built all the sets there. You know, one of the things about low budget films that I warn people still today is company moves, having to move from one location to the other will kill you in a low budget film. I just moved into my sound stage for five months. I was in there five months. Wow. We built all the sets there, did all the rehearsals there, painted everything there. And so by the time we were shooting, every frame, every frame was storyboarded. And uh, Lottie and I were, no one else knew. When the crew came and saw what we they do, were doing, they thought, what are these two guys are crazy? It's, it's unbelievable because we were doing a lot of static. They were static still shots. But I was moving props. I had things on, I was moving background props, but it looks, if you watch the film, it looks like Dolly moves. It does, 100%. I noticed when you, when you watch it again and after you told me that, you notice it, but it's in a way that it doesn't feel weird. It feels, it's like there's like a, it's so just beautiful. I don't know, it's like, it's so, it's like in your subconscious. You, you uh, yeah, I, I, had, I had actors on all sorts of machinery and. I was, when I brought actors into frame, they were on pulleys. And so when sometimes when I wanted movement, I would move the background props. So the people are sitting, are static, but the props were moving, but the camera was on lockdown. And this was all rehearsed, you know, obviously, but it worked wonderfully and it was in the spirit. One of the problems is now I'm shooting on this big sound stage. How am I gonna do a reversal? I had mm -hmm. no walls, how do you do it? And then I remember it was another Eureka moment. So, just go to infinity, black. Do the reverse on black. What's the difference? It'll work. But the black has to be inky, really dark black. Mm -hmm. It worked like a charm. So it was a, uh, it was a, uh, at the time I thought this is the end result of this style I was trying to work. This is as far as I could take it. And I believe that. And for the next few years after I was prepping other films, I thought, well, I'm going to move in another direction. Now, today, I consider that like that shot that we did, Death Warmed Over, the first one. Caligari to me is now that photo. It's actually the first. Now I am exploring this style even further in something we'll be doing in the future. It's the first one now. So that's, that's so and that is really true. At the end, I, well, 30 years ago, I said, that's the end. 30 years later, it's just the beginning. I love Same that. Thing. Yeah, I think. And uh, I just remember the camera crew because Lottie was, uh, we hired, Lottie didn't operate. We hired a Cracker Jack operator. And the gaffers, the first two days, they were staring, goes, because Lottie was calling all the light. You know, he doesn't use a meter, he calls it by his eye, he calls all the exposures by the eye. And they're going, what are these two guys doing? But <laughs> once they saw the dailies, they went, Oh my God, it looked. In fact, the lab called up. The lab called up and they said they wanted to talk to the filmmaker. I think, was it Photochem United? I don't, I forgot what lab we used at the time. They called up and the guy said, You made this film? It's low budget, right? He goes, I go, Why? He goes, I don't know what image is on it, but it's the richest negative I have ever seen. And I've been working here 20 years. It's the richest, and I, so I knew before I saw anything that something's on that film, it must look good. So that was, and then when everybody saw it, they got on board. In fact, we had a first assistant who was a wonderful uh, Steadicam operator. In fact, he did the Steadicam work in Blue Velvet, which, wow. and he was, to this day, he's top. And I had said, uh, he had told me, he says, if you want Steadicam, when I hired him, and I said, I don't have the budget for that. But by the third and fourth day, he pulled me aside. He goes, 
you know, I'm really enjoying what you're doing. I get it. He goes, if you need something, I can do it. And he did. And uh, I had one scene that I was hoping to do it in where they go through the asylum. So I got, I had a lot of, for, a lot of fortunate things happen. And I think it was just worked out well. Um, I think we, one thing we kind of have to talk about just because for our, even people who have not seen the film, the most iconic image is maybe the tongue. Yeah. Uh, which is this like incredible set piece. Do you want to talk about kind of like how that came to be and how it works? Because it's like, again, like, especially understanding like how few resources and how little money you have, it looks expensive. It looks yeah. very rich and beautiful. Well, the most important thing is I only like organic effects. I don't like, and to this day, even the CGI effects, I, I, I something I plan on doing is gonna, you know, it's all organic. It's just fits what I do. And I like that style. I much prefer it. It's a little more theatrical. It's the old Rob Bottin, Rick Baker style. It appeals to my sensibility. And, uh, Every, everything in Caligari was, was prepped and planned. There were not one, imp, nothing could be improvised. So we had it, it was all tight. And we had a good special effects man. He had worked on the thing for Rob Bottin. He was, uh, and he had, so what we thought when, and that was all written, it was, the whole scene was written. Uh, it was really a puppet. The tongue was a big puppet and a puppeteer handled it. So it was sculpted painted and they it, uh, the door was made of latex it's all in this the tradition of the uh comes right out of that school sort of the dick smith school or rick baker school but at the tongue was a puppet and it was and laura albert who was the lead who i just talked to who she loved that part she, she told me she's now a top stunt woman does love sorry to wow on coordinator yeah she she's in hawaii doing like a magnum pi movie or something but she said steven to this day all of my caligari memorabilia is in my office it was it's, it was the greatest month of my life and uh it was wonderful to hear her say that she worked so hard so it was uh she got into it i said i know you she goes i love doing that scene um, and I mean, we've talked a lot about the visuals, but I think that what also stands out is this like incredible dialogue and the writing as well. So um, you're obviously an incredibly talented like visual filmmaker, the music and the sound too. But like, I think what to me sustains everything and brings it all together is this like amazing, like it's almost like it's like a film noir on acid. Like I can't describe it in another way. It's, it's so incredible. Do you kind of want to talk about that? I agree with you completely. And that is because I have this brilliant partner on my side, Jerry Stahl, who specializes it. No one writes it better than that. And how we work sometimes, is I'll actually write the whole scene, including the dialogue. And then what Jerry does is he goes in and he's got three choices. One, he could keep the line if he likes it. He could tweak the line if he likes it. And what I like best of all, and always hope he does, is get rid of all the lines, including the ones I love that I wrote, and write new ones. And that's when the magic really starts. But he likes best when he has the template laid out in front of him. And without Jerry, then, you know, these things would not exist. They would just fall apart. There'd be a lot of pretty pictures and weird pictures. But uh, in storylines, never much matter. I remember a quote when I started uh, making Caligari, I caught up to a great quote by Joseph von Sternberg, who, uh, whose work I love. And he said, storyline means nothing to me. All I care about is the visuals, photography, and presentation. Well, I don't go that strong because the dialogue is everything to me. But I thought if I could always have the level of dialogue, especially so idiosyncratic, with the visuals and presentation, it's a good combination. And, uh, you know, I really know how, see, I know more than anyone how important it is because I'll write the script top to bottom. So I know what it originally looked like. And then um, early on, we always wrote together in the same room. By the time we got to Caligari, I was doing the draft and then Jerry, I like to say was, you know, took, it, took control of it then, but, uh, so I really know how important he is to the work. This would not exist without him.
And I mean, this is kind of like an overarching que uh, question about the way that your work, like obviously your start from the beginning is with Hustler, um, the way that you kind of approach sex and eroticism, because I think it's very unexpected for people. And maybe that's why people have strange assumptions as though your movies are not making money because they have strange ideas over what sex and cinema is for, about. Do you kind of want to talk about like how that works, especially within Caligari? Yeah, well, Caligari, somebody actually said to me, it should have been hardcore. It should have been a hardcore film because then it would have gone with the other two, two you did. And I, I didn't see it that way. I never thought to do it like that. First of all, that would really limit who would be in the film. So you have problems alone. But I never thought of, when I made the films, the sex is not to arouse. I don't understand why if you have a sex film, the, the implication is that now it has to arouse or it fails for some reason. It's, um, that's the last thing. I don't think Jerry and I ever once thought about anything having to do with the libido. We, that wasn't the intention. Just using sex. If you, I mean, when you look at these sex films, they're never about sex. They have sex in them, but they're never about sex, rarely. And I had no interest in these erotic thrillers. I'm sure they're good ones. I'm sure the Palmas made some, I'm sure, and others. I don't have any interest in that. But I like sex because of the imagery you're allowed to play with. It gives me a lot of ideas for, for images. That's and, the main reason. Um, I mean, one of the things too, so it's like after Caligari gets made is actually quite a big success is covered by like major magazines, major newspapers. Uh, That's people, shocking, isn't it? When you read the reviews. It's so, and a lot like. The Wikipedia page somebody sent me, I had never seen it and they said, it was poorly reviewed. And I said, well, you know, I could not believe the reviews in mainstream publications. Some very conservative publications. Like, oh. And they were excited by what they saw. And it's the same, the, the film was also seen by people who work in quote unquote mainstream Hollywood. And they were also just as the, the person developing your film surprised and I surprises like not even like doesn't even take it. It's like impressed like completely blown away by what you were able to accomplish with no money, especially when you take into account most Hollywood films are not able to accomplish what you did with money. So uh, do you want to kind of talk about like the kind of aftermath of the film's release and kind of its life afterwards? Well, here's the funny thing about it. Of course, once we made it, the producer, and I don't mean the line producer who was a filmmaker, who did a lot for me. Every, every couple of days, he would surprise me. He would, uh, suddenly I'd walk on the set, there'd be a crane and he would say, you earned this so I could do something special. And, but the man who financed it, once the film was made, he went and told everybody that the film was made for a half a million dollars. Now that's good for him because he's trying to sell it for a larger amount and subsequently it would have helped me financially. But I didn't want anybody to know that. I wanted to know what they did, what I did for a half a million dollars even. Well, okay, yeah, that's about right. But for $165,000, it's a big accomplishment. Yeah. Half a million, okay. You know, there are a lot of good looking half a million dollar films. The film in my range, there aren't too many films that have, there's some beautifully acted low budget films mm -hmm. and nice stories. I'm talking about the technical aspects. So that was always a problem because they were thinking the budget was bigger. And I might say Caligari, the first time it ever played was at the Toronto Film Festival. Yeah, Midnight Madness opening it was night. the opening film. And that was a tough year because Dario Argento was there with opera. And you know who was there was Herc Harvey with uh, Carnival of Souls. Wow. They had brought it back the way Fantasia will be bring place Caligari. And I remember meeting her, which, and I remember saying, you know, I'm, I'm, he goes, you're the opening film, right? I said, yeah, I said, and I remember thinking, what's it feel like to have a film you made like in 62, I think it was, all these years later, you know, people still are interested. They wanna know a new audience. And he said, it feels really fantastic. And I remember thinking to myself, could I possibly be lucky to 
30 years from now, I'm sure enough, it's, it's like happening, which really is, you know, on a mm -hmm. personal level, I, you know, I get a little thrilled from that because of that connection of her carving. So. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, what is so, so interesting is like your work has had such an influence on culture. I mean, kind of, uh, Burning Man, like you told me about that, found it, like it plays in tense at Burning Man. It I plays at Rain. I heard, I didn't know if it was, I said, is this, this could be, uh, is, I don't know if it's apocryphal, I'm not sure, but someone said, you know, your movie plays, I go to Burning Man and I saw it there. That's how that started. And I guess you looked it up and saw yeah. some reference of it. Yeah, someone's like, I in the year 2000, I think it was like the year 2000. So like I was, I walked into a tent of Burning Man and the strangest <laughs> film was playing. Um, so that's like an incredible thing. And um, we're talking about like such an incredible legacy. And um, we don't want to go too deep into this, but like obviously after Caligari, like you had, you had like, what do you call it? The world kind of opened up to you. And unfortunately things took an unfortunate detour. Um, luckily now you're kind of back working, you have a new script and things are going to back on track. One detour. It, yeah. yeah. To put it to, 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 yeah, it, it was a 15 year health crisis of which fortunately I have a hundred percent covered. In fact, this week it was the 14th anniversary of a uh, liver transplant, but I've never felt, I feel like I'm 30 right now. Ready to, you know, I've been, I've been for the last four or five years, I've been working pretty steady, but this uh, uh, never felt better. So, yeah, and it's so it's so funny too that uh, Caligari. What helped me was the reviews. People didn't see the movies, but they read the reviews. It was you got a great review in the LA Times, and it oh, back then there was still midnight movies, so it opened at the New Art, which is the seminal theater that mm -hmm. I think one of the from the West Coast certainly. It started uh, Pink Flamingos and Eraserhead and Cafe Flesh played there for a long time. Yeah, they, uh, well, uh, I was gonna say, um, for people who are interested, I'm actually gonna create like a collection so people can actually go and read their all the reviews. Cause like we have like so much, like so many incredible resources because they are so like, people don't even know what to make of it but rather than trash it they're like no this is incredible like that's what's so cool i mean people that major the funny thing jay scott in toronto gave it a four-star review a uh, david edelstein who was on cbs morning entertainment weekly i mean under i think it was on the he gave it one of their highest ratings i remember uh it, in a, uh, orange county register very conservative but a big public uh, big circulation through the roof review got a uh cover story in the LA Times um, when it opened. And uh, I remember Seattle Times. I, it's, those reviews, you hate to say this, but you need them when you're we're, with somebody like me who is on the fringes because people read it and then they'll say, oh, maybe it's interesting. And even, believe it or not, I sent Caligari before it was released. I, the studios back then, I don't know if they're doing it now, but there was an acquisition editor, all the majors. Mm -hmm. And they would see anything. If you had a finished 35 millimeter, they might only look at two minutes of it. Yeah. But if you had it done, the acquisition, it made the rounds. I got calls from every acquisition say, what is this? Of course, we can't put this at Warner Brothers. Yeah. And one of the acquisition editors was a... Uh, eventually became the president of Warner Brothers. I remember him calling me saying, I can't play this because what are we gonna do with it? But what do you have next? So that was, uh, which is for another time, can make a whole nother uh, about my meetings that I had <laughs> about what I was gonna do next. Pretty funny. I mean, and now you are doing something next, which is going to be super, like, I'm, I'm like looking forward to it. Um, you and Jerry are like such a tremendous talent. And I feel like, like D Dr. Caligari now is as exciting and radical as it must have been when it came out. So I can only imagine what you're going to do next, which is like so exciting, right? Now, the only thing I'll say is it is a new script. It's called Hell is Tender. And it's a, a love story, unusual. And it is 
I would say Caligari with an adult theme, more with a little bit mature, in other words, a storyline. And <laughs> I'll believe no more. That's how mature it is. It's actually got a storyline. However, in the script, if you read the script of Caligari, because one of the beautiful things is I had the money before I shot it. So I didn't have to describe everything. Yeah. I had a separate script for myself with the descriptions. So let's say the opening scene, I put living room. The woman watches television in the opening scene. That's all it said. So I built that and you know the opening dreamscape. Yeah. So the first time the producer came, he walked onto the set and saw it. And he said, Stephen, where's the living room? I said, you're standing in it. <laughs> That's so incredible though. Um, I think it's like, we're gonna be, finishing this up, but I'm wondering, cause like you have like so many stories. I don't know if there's anything else you wish we covered or like that you want to like add a final note. No, uh, if any, I, I just I just love having the opportunity to talk to, you know, the fans that uh, there are fans of the film because I get the letters and um, anyway, you can share these things with them. It makes me feel really good because they're the ones that have kept it alive. And I, one of the things that is remarkable is the new people that came up, uh, the, the websites that have been so kind to this film, like Mondo, Heather, Heather Drain. And there's so many, uh, somebody named Yum Yum writes beautifully. There's a, uh, I can, I'd like to send them each a thank you note personally because they've kept it alive. And uh, there's a whole group out there. Yeah, I think it speaks so much to um, this underground kind of critical community too, that really does celebrate and in Europe, because yeah. when I go to, I was there in La Trange in Paris and at off screen in Brussels, the Calvagari fans came out and drove. And by the way, speaking of the wonderful dialogue, if it was up to me, it would always be subtitled, even in English, even mm -hmm. when it plays. I was never happy with the recorded sound. I always wanted to re-record it, which is why restorations are great. And uh, uh, but when it played and you could actually see the words, everybody really enjoyed it. Because when it plays in France, it, when it played in Brussels, it was in French, English. It had three subtitles going at the same time. And it worked beautifully. I remember yeah. just reading it. Yeah, I always like that. I, I, I whenever I go see festivals in, in Europe, that's there's something charming about it. And isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. love that. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Stephen, so much. This has been such an incredible conversation. I feel as though um, we we touched on everything in depth, and yet like we barely scratched the surface, um, which is exciting and fun. Um, and again, I'd love to I'm thank. A sign right now that says "Don't give it all away, save some." Yeah, no, you so have. That's a strict instructions for the next time. And uh, I mean, we're also like, it's not. I don't know. I don't know if it's announced. Cafe Flash is also going to be available in the next couple of years, at least. No, it's on its way. It's on its way. It's, we, yeah. Once we had the total control of these movies, everything started to happen. It first falls into have, place. First, you have to get the films, you know, be, get the ownership. Then once that happens and the rights, you know, once you are able to, then it goes to work because it's never, Caligari's never had a release. It's yeah. been, I mean, uh, there's a, Everything on um, DVD, at least, is practically bootleg. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the thing. And I, you also got, like, maybe the best. No no offense to any other people who are working in restoration. You maybe got the best team in the world. So, you, like, no, you know that. No one knows it better than me. And the best producer. Daniel so Bird. The fact that Daniel Bird got involved is the reason this exists. He did it for, for all of you Barachik fans. This is Daniel, so... And he, yeah. so knowing just to be in the, working with the guy who brought Barachik back to life, I'm a huge fan of Barachik's work, so that's exciting. Yeah, and thank you. I would also like to thank him because he's the one who introduced me to your work and introduced me to you. So, um, this is all he's like, in. yes, he's yeah. a he's a he's a he, like a he's an underground cinema hero, let's say that. Yeah. Um, so thank you again and thank you to everyone who's listened um, continue to write reviews continue to share and like keep your eyes open for uh, Cafe Flash keep your eyes open also for Stephen's next film because I know I'm going to be 
I'm going to buy your tickets like in advance whenever it comes out. So uh, thank you. You got it.